So here's where we are. We're starting a new model, and we're starting a new way to think about economics. So this is where the promise math, 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 math is coming in. It starts today. Um, everything I show on the board, I will be giving to you as slides. So you know, take notes or not as, as you want. Personally, what I would do is I would take extra notes for things that aren't on the board, and then you know, you'll get the board thing. But you, know, you do you, however, however the note thing works for you. Um, I find that with algebra, it is really helpful to see someone actually doing it rather than just slide, slide, slide. So I'm going to draw out all the equations. My handwriting is horrible. You'll have to bear with me. I will try to explain what I'm doing as I'm going along. You will see me going along. You will see me making mistakes and going back. Um, and this is to say that this is part of the process. Like None of this is easy or straightforward or natural. It is something by the end of the semester, if you do the homeworks and, and whatnot, you will be good at. It will be fairly second nature to you. It is not that hard once you come to grips with it. But coming to grips with it is hard, and you should not expect it to be a breeze. Like it, it, It's going to be a thing to learn. Once you learn it, you'll know it. But until you, until you learn it, you won't. And so we are going to be telling essentially the same story that we were telling before with the graphs, we are going to be telling in math. And so I'm going to convert all of that story, or most of that story, into a mathematical representation so we can talk about expectations in, in sort of a, a more rigorous way. Okay? We won't be doing the indifference curve of the central bank. We will be mapping out what is possible for the central bank, given that people are trying to guess what it's doing. So we won't have the indifference curve part, but the rest of the model will be there just in a different form. Now, I know when I first started doing this stuff, I had an undergraduate degree in a, a less prestigious institution than UCD, San Francisco State University. Bless their hearts. And there was no math at all all the way through. And so when I saw it for the first time when I got to graduate school that this is actually how economists do this stuff. And for a whole year, I did not see the connection between what I had done before and, and the new stuff. And then somehow in the summer of the, of the first year, it occurred to me, no, it was all exactly the same stuff. There was no difference at all in the stuff I did in undergraduate and the stuff I did in graduate school. They were just telling the stories in a different way. So here we're going to be telling the stories in a different way mathematically. And again, the point of this is to force us to be really clear about what we're assuming in the model so that we're not making assumptions that we don't know about just sort of in the back of our head. And two, to force us to think extremely logically about the problem, so that we're not making any leaps of logic. We're not sort of forgetting something. We're being extremely rigorous. Once you have it in mathematical form, your story, you can do any legal math stuff, and that's going to be a logical thinking, because mathematics is, of course, a very logical way to, to think. Right? So that's where we're going, Fisher-Gray model, which is essentially, at its heart, this augmented Phillips curve model. Okay. Okay, that's what we had last time. And I will. Get rid of this because it's unnecessary. And so how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to have a little bit of notation for you just so that you can keep track. Not get this point at me. Capital letters like capital X, and I put in little, little serifs on it to indicate capital. These are going to be levels of variables. Okay. It might be a capital M for the money supply. It might be a capital Y for GDP. These are the things that we know and love and have come to respect in our travels, or disrespect in our travel. One way or the other, these are the things we know. Right. These are the, the real things that are observable in the world. All the normal stuff will be in capital letters. Okay. Small letters will be the natural log of the capital letters. So little x is equal to the natural log 
of capital X. And you're saying, what the hell, what were logs again? I can't remember, and what the heck is the natural log? So let me remind you what logs are about, because we're going to do a lot with logs for a reason that, that we're going to see later. Empirical people do a lot with logs of numbers for a couple of reasons. One, it makes their things empirically they want, the way they want them to look. And two, differences in natural logs are growth rates. And so you get growth rates out of your empirical specification very quickly. Theorists use natural logs a lot because, first of all, growth rates are interested in theory as well. As it's macroeconomics, growth rates and things are a thing, right? So you know, differences in logs are going to be useful for us. And particularly, we do it because it can make things that are otherwise nonlinear linear, and which, which is why we're going to do it here. Because linear equations are easy for us to work with. We know them from algebra. Nonlinear equations are a pain in the butt. We just rather would not if we can avoid it. And lots of times, natural logs will take your nonlinear things, certain nonlinear things, and make them linear. And we're going to see that here today. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about logs just to remind you of the bits that we need for this class. There's lots of neat things about logs. But let me tell you a little bit about natural logs. So log to the base 10 of x equals, what does that equal? Well, in the log to the base 10 of x, it's going to be equal to how many times do I have to multiply 1 1 by 10 in order to get x? So log of 1, log to the base 10 of 1, is just 1. I'm sorry, 0. It's just 0. I need to multiply 1 0 times by 10 to get 1. Right? Log to the base 10 of 10 is 1. I need to multiply 1 by 10 once to get, to get 10. Log to the base 10 of 100 is 2. I need to multiply by 1 by 10 once and then twice to get 100, right? and so on. So fair enough. That's just the definition of it. ln of x is equal to log to the base e of x, where e is that special number 2.71. It's one of those super special numbers like pi. Goes on forever. It's got loads of properties. There's actually a direct connection with pi. Whole world of mathematics about that. But it's just a particular number. So it's how many times do I need to multiply 1 by this special number, 2.7 what's it, to get whatever number I want. Okay? That's all it is. Okay. We are using it because of a few special properties. Yeah. We actually could use any log here, but because growth rates are of interest, differences in the natural log become growth rates. And so that's the specialty of the natural log. It's the, the specialty of this super number, 2.7, what's it? Euler's magic number. Um, Euler's magic number, I suppose, if we pronounce him correctly. But I'm American. We don't pronounce anything correctly. He, he can suck it. OK. Um, we got the bomb. We can pronounce things how we like. OK. So this is, this is what log is. Um, just to, to sort of draw it out to give you an idea, if this was x here, our little capital X, and here we have our natural log of x, and here we have 1, we said the log to the base anything of 1 is going to be 0, because we need to multiply 0, uh, we need to multiply 1 zero times by whatever to get one, right? And so our, our function goes through here. And then it looks something like this. Okay, this is, looks like that. Okay, so we have, and, of 
1 is equal to 0, right, because it takes 0, multiplying this by, multiplying 1 by, zero, by e, 0 times gives you the number you're looking for. ln of e is equal to 1, because you need to multiply 1 by this special number e once to get e. Okay. And ln to 1 over e is equal to negative 1. That is, if we think about how many times we need to multiply it by, by e, we need to multiply it negative 1 times. That is, divide it by e in order to get that number 1 over e. Okay. So which is why it's negative to the left of, of 1. Okay. Now, we are going to be saying like, well, well, I'll get to it. But actually, I should do it here. So one of the things we're going to be interested in, of course, is GDP. And here I have capital GDP. That's just GDP that we know and love. And then I am going to take little y, which is going to be the natural log of GDP, right. which is fine. I can do that. I can just define a new letter. This is all I've done. I've defined a new letter equal to that thing. But notice that my little y can be negative. GDP itself must be positive because it's the amount of goods and services we produce. At lowest, it could be zero. Right. We don't count destruction. It's nothing new. It's nothing new in the world with destruction. So it, it can only be 0, as the lowest it can be. But if we take the log of, of small numbers, we're going to get a negative number. So our little y can actually be negative. Okay? But look, this is a one-to-one -one function. Now, aside from the waviness, the higher x goes, the higher ln goes. So if our little y goes up, we know that GDP itself has gone up. Right, so we're going to be looking at differences between output and potential output, the, the normal level of output. Right? This, is, this is how we define business cycles, for instance. So we're going to be looking at differences between those things, ln of, little, ln of y versus ln of, of y bar, right? differences. And that's going to be what percentage higher is our output now, right? if that comes out to 0.3. It's 30% higher output than, than the normal level of output. Okay, so this is going to be a useful thing, even though this little y in and of itself can be a negative thing. So, so be aware that it can be negative. This is not a problem, because we're actually interested in, in big Y. But when we see little y go up, it's going to mean big Y went up as well. So we can, we can follow along in that way. And we can go back and forth between these whenever we want. We won't actually want, so we won't do that, but we, we could go back and forth because it's a one-to-one. -one. The higher x, the higher ln x. And so we can just go back and forth. We can invert the equation and go back. OK. OK. Now we have one more feature. And this, this is all well and good and, and happy, but it's of no particular use to us here other than the growth rate thing, which is Nice, but not super important for us as theorists. Super important for empirical guys, but for us, we, we wouldn't care. But there's one more feature about logs. And this is true of all logs, but we're particularly going to be using this natural log with this special number e for, so we can get the growth rates. So I'll just be talking about that. But this is true about all logs. If, if for example, uh, let me y, and here's just any y, is equal to alpha times x. Then ln of y is equal to ln of alpha times x. That's kind of obvious. Um, I say this, though, because this is a one to one function. We're, we're doing math, right? And we're going to be telling these in terms of stories. These are all going to be economic stories. But, and we're going to kind of write our story like the first one. Like output is this function, this constant, times some level x, say labor supply or something, right? how many people work. Right? So we can think of x as the number of people who work for a minute. Then this is a story that says if more people are working, output is higher, and we multiply it by this alpha. 
Right? So this is, a, this is a story I could tell in economics if I'm so inclined. We'll have a more complicated version, but we, I could do this. Then once I have that story, the story is the first line, then I have it in an equation form. Right? This is a story about production. This is a story about how factories work. You put in workers and they spit out product. How much product do they spit, it, spit out? Each worker spits out alpha product. Right? This is a story about how a factory works. Okay? Once I have that story, this looks like an equation, but it's actually a story, I can do any legal mathematical thing to it that I want. I can divide it by negative 73. I can take it to the 43rd power. I can divide it by 7. I can do whatever the heck I like, any legal mathematical thing, as long as I do it to both sides. I can't divide by 0. Well, I'm limited in that way. But pretty much anything else, anything legal in math, I can do. And it's fine. Some aren't going to be useful, but some are going to be useful. Right? So one of the things I can do is I could take the natural log of both sides. Okay. Now you can say, yeah, you could, but you know, it's like Jurassic Park. They were so concerned whether they could, they didn't c consider whether they should. Well, I did it, and now we got to deal with dinosaurs. It's all, all on us. Um, but I can do it, right? Now, this, is, this one is going to turn out to be useful, unlike the dinosaurs, but this is going to be useful. But the thing is, anything I want, legal, mathematically, it's totally fine. Okay? Sometimes useful, sometimes not. All right. So I did this. Brilliant for me. But the natural log has this, and any log has this lovely feature that I can write that right hand side as ln of alpha plus ln of x. And so all of a sudden, I get this little y is equal to ln of alpha, which is just some kind of constant, plus little x. So I've separated out the alpha from the x. And this is going to be super, super handy for us. This is going to be a big deal. And this is why it's used so often in, in economics. Um, in economic theory, these natural logs, because they can take things that are multiplied by each other, which are messy algebraically, and turn them into things that are added and subtracted with each other, which are much easier, neater, and cleaner to deal with. And you can always go back the other direction. Okay? So this is why we love them. And why you, know, you, you have to deal with it. So for example, if capital Y is equal to capital X over capital Z, you see I'm struggling to write capitals. And these might be two different variables, right? These might be two things that might change all the time. And you know, Z might be the productivity of the economy, and, and X might be the number of workers. And the productivity of the economy might be changing over time, depending on whether you know, capital technology is getting better. So Z might be changing at the same time that X is changing. And so now we have a nonlinear thing that is a real and genuine pain to deal with in any kind of algebra. Okay? Can be done, but so painful. And why? Well, we don't need to. Well, we just take the, the log of both sides. And we get ln of y equals ln of x over z, which gives us ln of y equals ln of x minus ln of z. Right, because division is just negative multiplication in, in, a, in a useful and, and, now, and th in this particular sense. And so we get little y is equal to little x minus little z. A nice, neat, linear thing that we can deal in really grade school algebra, we can deal with it. Right? We don't even need division. Like everything's going to be so much easier for us doing it this way than doing it with division. 
Okay, so this is why we do it, mostly in theory. Okay, and we're, we're going to be making use of this. Okay, questions about, about logs? There's all kinds of lovely features of logs. We're not going to use the vast majority. Loads of things. We take derivatives of logs. They're natural log. Hey, take derivatives of any log. It's a mess. But take a derivative of a natural log. Really simple, neat, and clean. So that's useful as well for the, when well, we've tried to find slopes of things. Loads of neat, neat features. We use them all the time. They are absolutely everywhere. Um, there we go. As an aside, for empirical folks, okay, none of us, obviously, but, but weirdos, empirical weirdos, they have a, a situation where they might want to be saying y is equal to alpha plus beta x plus epsilon, right? Where they want to say, how does y depend on x? And, and y might be, for example, hours worked, or GDP, or, or something like that, very often. And, and they want, and so these are capitals, and they want to say that this is normal. I know a lot of you are taking econometrics nowadays, or statistics nowadays. This is a normal distribution. Normal distribution has this feature. We have a normal distribution. Looks something like that, the bell curve. It used to be on the German money. Like Gauss invented it. It was on the German money. It was right there, the bell curve, because it is so central to science everywhere. Um, it's, it's like a real thing. Um, but the feature of the bell curve is that tail going off to the left goes on forever, like literally forever. Um, negative 100 million, there's some positive probability of negative 100 million there. Right? And so if we really thought that this was the world and we were doing our regressions, it kind of can't be, right? It, it can't be right because this epsilon might be negative, no, negative 100 million, in which case we're going to have negative 50 million hours worked. Well, how do you have negative hours worked? How do you have negative GDP? These are things that can't happen, right? And so if we specify it this way, right off the get-go, we know that our specification is wrong. Now, that doesn't necessarily make it bad because all specifications are wrong, because they're all simplifications of the world, so of course they're wrong. But, you know, we might as well make it at least plausible that it's right. This is, this is clearly wrong. And maybe the numbers are so high and the distribution is so small that we can kind of ignore that tail of the distribution. And so well, yeah, maybe it's kind of kosher. But it's not literally true. It can't be literally true because this is a thing. Y is a thing that can't be negative. And this shock, this, this, this epsilon term, the way we've this defined it, can be infinitely negative, as negative as you like. So it can't literally be true. Maybe it's OK. Maybe it's close enough for government work. But we built in, we already see a flaw in our thing, right? We know it's wrong, but do we have to build it in in a way that we know it's wrong? Like, that, that's not right, right? So if we take the logs, if we look, so we got little y is equal to, now let me see, beta, uh, uh, let me see, gamma plus, now, what's another Greek letter? Gamma plus, I forget, wiggles, wiggle. I got so many Greek letters. Now we'll, we'll do big gamma times little x plus epsilon tilde. We specify these in logs. As we just made up this first equation, so we can make up a different equation. We can make up an equation in logs. And y, even if y is always positive, we get y, we get L and Y, we get this, this thing, right? So our log can, can be infinitely negative even when Y itself is positive. And so now this negative shock that's really big just means that Y is really, really small. It doesn't mean that it's literally negative because our 
Now we can go as far down as we want and still have positive y. That just asymptotically approaches the origin. So now we haven't built in any errors. We know it's not true still because the world is obviously more complicated than this equation, but at least we haven't, you know, we can't just see it right on the page. We have to like use introspection about the world to know this, which is you know, better. So a lot of times doing your empirical specifications in logs can be nicer for that reason. Okay. Now, in truth be told, empirical people don't talk about that so much. They talk about logs for other reasons. Like taking the log can make it linear very much like a, a theorist, but this is, this is a feature. Okay. okay. Let's start the model. Okay, so all this was sort of background, just mathematical background so that you're up to speed. Okay. Okay, and I'm going to start by thinking about how does stuff get produced. Right, so we're, we're kind of trying to come up with our Phillips curve model. We're going to talk about it mostly in terms of output instead of in terms of labor, but you'll see we can be able to do it in terms of labor if we wanted to anyway. Um, but it's going to be the same thing. We're gonna, so let's talk about the labor market. Right? In our labor market, how did we tell them the, the story in our Phillips curve model? We said we have some number of workers out there. We have labor supply. We got labor demand. And this is the real wage, wage over price, right? This was our story, that with a high real wage, people wanted to hire less workers. La labor demand was lower, but more workers wanted to go. We didn't specify it explicitly, but clearly that was our story. We had this whole story about there's this wage negotiation process. Workers want to work for a million euros. Employers want to you know, have everyone work for free, and we come, somehow come together in the middle. That's this, right? Work, if, if we were free, they'd hire loads of workers. If we, they were free, very few of us would go to work. And somehow in the middle, they come up with, with uh, a wage. So we're going to have this. This is. I should actually be careful about capital letters. These are capitals. N is clearly capital, right? And so this is going to be, did I call it W bar? I think I called it W bar. That's oh, way up here. Yeah, W bar. That's going to be our negotiated wage if we knew what prices were. But of course, we're going to have this problem of predicting prices the same way we did in the Phillips curve model. Right? Our problem was we didn't know what the inflation rate was going to be. We made a guess about inflation, and that, that informed what our wage was. And if everything was normal, we'd get the normal level of wages, which we're calling W bar. Okay? So this is the, the same story we won't tell before. Um, but I'm going to be a little more, more explicit about where, where stuff comes from, because we're not going to only want to talk about workers. We're going to want to talk about output as well. And so we need to say how workers get translated into output. So I'm going to actually specify this labor supply function a little bit. Okay? And this is in a very standard way. Um, it's standard enough that it is worth learning just in and of itself. Um, we won't drone on about it, but it is, is a thing. So I'm going to have a production function. And my inputs to the production function are going to be capital. That is, in order to make anything, you need some kind of capital, some kind of machine, maybe a shovel. And you need somebody to do the work. Okay. And we're not going to talk about education. And some workers are better than others. We're not going to talk about any of that stuff. This is macro. We're abstracting from all that. Workers are just units. Give me 10 units a worker. And capital is just units. There's no this machine versus that machine. Okay. We're just going to specify them. And so 
Our production function is output, again making this capital, time t. So this is output at time t. Okay. So right off the bat, we started getting explicit about time, right? Because this Phillips curve model is a model very much about time. We're setting our wages before we know what the prices are going to be. And the wages we set depend very much on what we expect the future prices to be. So we have to disentangle the present from the future. Right? And so I want to be keeping track of when things are happening very explicitly. And particularly we're, we're concerned, like what we want to learn out of this is how expectations are formed and what central banks can do to influence expectations. So we have to be really careful about what happens when. When do people form their expectations? When do things get realized? And so I'm putting little subscripts on things to say when it happened. So time t is some arbitrary time, but you can think about it as now. Time t is now. Whereas time t minus 1, is last year, and time t plus 1 is next year. And you'd have plus t plus 2, that's two years from now, and so on and so forth. Right? That's output in time t, just GDP. This is our normal everyday GDP. And that's going to equal k to the alpha and t to the 1 minus alpha. 0 is less than alpha which is less than 1. And I am going to make this constant. So this is So if I wanted a fancier model with more, more discussion of investment, and where does investment come from? I would not want to make capital constant because investment is what leads to new capital in the future, right? And so if I'm really talking about a model where investment is important, I have to talk about how do people increase or decrease investment? Does it depreciate over time? Do I have to keep investing just to stay where I am? I have to really specify where capital comes from. But we are going to start with the simplest model that tells the story we want to tell about expectations and that's, that's a story really about that Phillips curve, about wage expectations. And so for that story, I don't need anything going on with capital. I don't need to talk about investment. I'm really, like when I told the whole Phillips curve story, I never talked about investment. Right? So we can leave that out in our simplest model. And the way we're going to leave it out is just to say that capital is constant. It doesn't change over time. Okay? Not realistic, but that allows us to focus on the labor market without worrying about how that, that feeds over into the capital, capital markets and the building of infrastructure and all of that. Now, all of that's super important. And when, when Mr. Fisher and Ms. Gray were, were working on these models, they did put, put um, investment and capital in a lot of them. Like, this is a thing that people study. But this is your first pass at this stuff. We don't need to put that in. And to put that in, we're going to have to specify where does investment come from? Which means there's going to be another equation explaining to us where investment comes from. So it's just going to make things mathematically more complicated. And it's not necessary to tell the story we want to tell. Okay? Now I belabor this because this is what we do in theory all the time. This is how theories are constructed. You think, what story do I want to tell? Let me tell it in the simplest way that I possibly can. Okay? You tell the story in the simplest way. And then you say, well, how does my story interact with other stories that might be told? And then you start putting those things in. But first, you tell your story as simply as possible. Because remember, the whole reason we're doing this is because the world is complicated, too difficult for us to understand. So we put it into something simple where we can understand one effect really well. And then we add effects as we go along. Okay. So we're going to tell the simplest one we can. And we're going to have capital be constant. And just to make our life easy, we're going to pick units This is called normalization. So that k bar is equal to 1. 
because one will just disappear and that's gorgeous, right? We don't want one, this whole thing floating around. Okay. NT is labor. So the amount of laborers that we have working on this thing. And alpha is a parameter. So if we graph this thing, if I put capital Y here and N here, if I have zero workers, I get zero output. Because right? N to this, this 1 minus alpha, so the n to this fraction, so it's like the square root, right? It's the square root of 0. If, if alpha happens to be 1 half, then it's the square root. Take the square root of the number of workers, 0 workers, square root of that is 0. And then it goes up like this. This is n to the 1 minus alpha. Looks like that. So our production function. If I go on to the next page, after all of that is yt is equal to n to the 1 minus alpha. Alpha is somewhere between 0 and 1, somewhere in that range. Okay. Greek letters are going to be parameters. Greek letters are things that do not change over time. And most normal letters are variables, things that somehow are getting chosen by the model, things that we're trying to explain with the model. The only exception are things with bars over them, like that k bar, which are constant. We're not trying to explain those. But a more sophisticated version of the model could explain those as well. Okay. Okay. We only have k bar and we're going to have y bar, which is going to be the, you know, the, the potential output. OK. That's our production function. That's saying, where does stuff come from? Stuff comes from people working. More people work, the more stuff. But you have loads and loads more people working. You get diminishing returns to their, their labor because you have a limited number of machines. You have a limited number of machines, one machine. And you got more and more people working that, with that machine. They become less and less. Each additional worker becomes less and less productive. That's why we got the, the slope going off. People with me on the story so far? It's math, but you should also be thinking of the story because it is economics. It's not just math. It's going to look a lot like just math, but it's, we're telling stories with all this. right? So here we have our usual production function story. You put workers in, you get a lot of output. You put more workers in, you keep getting more output, but at a diminishing rate. OK. OK. Now we're going to have firms that that want to hire workers. How many workers do they want to hire? Well, if there's some wage, WT, let me get, make this capital. So this whole thing, the whole thing as a whole, is the real wage. So those are the real wages. So let's suppose that they're, they're given by some market out there. And we have an individual firm that can't change the wage because it's given in the marketplace. So this is the real wage that's on offer. How many workers will this firm hire? Well, it'll hire workers up till the point where the marginal product of labor is equal to the real wage, right? So in equilibrium, this is going to be the marginal product of labor at time t. Right? That is, how much stuff does one extra worker produce? If one extra worker produces a lot more stuff, than the real wage, that is the number of things that we have to give him to work there, then that's all pure profit. So we hire the guy. And as long as the marginal product of labor is higher than the wage we have to pay him, we're going to keep hiring more. Right? And we're going to stop hiring workers when these two are just equal. 
Okay. And because the slope of that production function gets flatter and flatter and flatter, the marginal product of labor, which is just the slope of that production function, that is going to get lower and lower and lower. All right, so if we, we graph this out, we get y again. I'm oh, sorry, we get y over here. y, and we get n. y looks like that. And if we're at this level of n, the slope of that is the marginal product of labor. It is, if we increase n a little bit, how much more stuff do we get? Right, so at the beginning, that's very steep. We increase labor a little bit, we get a lot of stuff because we got one guy working with one machine. But when we add another guy, well, there's two guys working with one machine. That second guy is less productive, and the slope gets flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter. And we're just going to keep hiring guys until the slope is equal to what we have to pay them. Okay. Choose n. Which is the marginal product of labor is equal to the real wage. Okay. And that is the firm profit maximization decision on how many workers to hire. So we're just having firms maximize their profit in this environment. Okay. Looks like math. It's actually a story. Okay. OK, so how do we find the slope of that thing? Well, the product of labor is this, the marginal product of labor is find the slope. We need to find the slope of this thing. So as we change, y, change n, how does y change? Okay. And the way we do this, here we go, we take the derivative. Now, this is calculus. I know many of you have had it. I know some of you have not had it. I am just going to do this. I am not going to make you regurgitate this. But so I won't test you on this here, but it's just a way to find the slope. Okay, we're looking for the slope of this function. We know it starts out very steep and it gets flat. Right. So if I take the derivative of this thing, derivative of y with respect to n is equal to 1 minus alpha, taking the power down n to the 1 minus alpha minus 1, and subtracting 1 from the power. So the marginal product of labor is equal to 1 minus alpha times n to the minus alpha. Okay. Now, I will not ask you to give that back to me. I, I don't memorize it. That's pointless. But if you've seen calculus, you know this is what we're doing. Right. And if you haven't seen calculus, this is not a calculus class. I'm not here to teach you calculus. You can be aware that it's, it's just a, a very simple thing. You take the power down. You subtract 1 from the power as a formula. But we're just finding that slope. It's just a tricky way to find that slope as an exact formula. Okay, that, that's all. Okay. People with me here? Maybe, maybe not. OK. And so this gives us this is kind of our labor demand, gives us wage at time t over price at time t is equal to, this is capital price at time t, is equal to 1 minus alpha and t to the negative alpha. So that looks something like we have n here and we have marginal product of labor here. It starts out high and it goes down. Initially, each guy adds a lot to, to output, and as you increase your number of guys, 
the, the amount that each additional guy brings in goes down. It's just another way of saying that slope gets flatter and flatter. This is, this is the slope. Initially, it's steep, and it gets flatter and flatter. That is, the slope goes down. OK. Well, this is lovely, and I'm sure you're all thrilled for me to have found it. But what I want to do is I want to say that this is a nonlinear thing, right? We have n to the negative alpha. That's like a whole mess. Who wants to be involved with that? That's, that's nobody's friend. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. So this is little wt minus little pt is equal to ln 1 minus alpha plus ln nt to the minus alpha. Right? These are ln of capital W. Right, so now I've switched to small letters. So I, you, you can see I'm struggling to write the capital letters. But before long, we're going to be working entirely in small letters. And so I, I'll be able to be sloppy again. But no, at the moment, we're going to our small letters for the first time. Right, so little wt. And now I need to do another feature of the logs, which is ln 1 minus alpha. And here I have a. have an exponent. So as I do that, I can write this. I'm going to take this minus alpha down, minus alpha times ln of nt. This is another feature of logs, which is lovely and important for us, that we got rid of the exponent as well. We not only got rid of the multiplications and divisions, we got rid of the exponent and brought it down as just a constant. A okay? feature of logs. We can do that. And so this whole thing becomes, and this is our last bit for the day, and I'm going to call this equation 1. It's, uh, am I? No, I'm not. I'm not going to call it 1. We're almost to 1, but we will, we'll leave it there. This is ln w, uh, little wt minus little pt equals ln 1 minus alpha minus alpha little nt, right? This is the natural log of n. And so I can write this wt. Huh. This is equation one, and I will magnanimously let you go because I don't know. It doesn't seem worth burning for. 